Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and I hope all of you are having a great day because... Here on the program, we have a lot of very interesting news to uh, you know to go over in the second part of the program, including hey you know hey I at this point I am a hundred percent convinced that companies out there leak kind of quote unquote uh, you know interesting tidbits about their phone that you know pre orders start next week, but for some weird reason the hydrogen one smartphone. Uh, specs were leaked, so looking forward to talking about that, even though I'm pretty sure it's a form of advertising, but hey, whatever. Uh, so we have that to cover, uh, this whole thing about Facebook and their and their glitchy ad services, and uh, just a lot more, so a lot going on, but as I said, second part of the show. In the first part, we have a company, as we are wont to do, and today's company is going to be uh, is going to be a uh, project called Igloo Home, and this is going to be great for anyone out there who has ever you know kind of dealt with locks and smart locks and smart homes, and even on top of that, there's also a lot of integration. Uh, you know, maybe if you run an Airbnb, you, you run a rental, or you have uh, people coming in and out of your home at weird hours and you want to be able to control the flow of traffic, well, this is going to be a very cool segment for you. So we're going to get into that in just a moment, but a couple of things, including ComputerAmerica.com, that's where you'll find everything from today's show notes, which will include a link to our guest website, any articles, reviews, uh, videos, anything that we show here on the program today, you can find there as well. Also, be sure to check out the social media contest brought to you by Logitech, as well as twitch.tv forward slash Computer America, uh, where we have a stream at our website for the video portion of the show. We're still a radio program, but hey, no reason not to have a video portion nowadays. Now, all that and more at ComputerAmerica.com, and let's go ahead, introduce our guest, and get talking about, you know, what it is that Igloo Home does. So joining us by phone today here is uh, the one, the only, Mr. Matthew Eng, and he is the Head of Americas and VP of Product for Igloo Home. And Matthew, thank you for coming on the show today. How are you doing? Oh, uh, mute switch. Uh, hopefully you turn that. Hi, can you hear me? There we go. Hey, Matthew, how are you doing? Good. Um, nice to be here. Thank you, Ben, for having us. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Glad that you could join us. And uh, obviously, uh, very excited to uh, you know to check out your product. It's very very sleek. Uh, anyone out there watching the video portion, we're going to have your website up. You know, kind of showing off the product and uh, details and stuff like this. It's a very slick looking uh, device you have here. So before we get into the device and what it is that you guys do, let's get a bit of background. Uh, when was Igloo Home started and how did you find yourself working with the company? So uh, yeah, Igloo Home is a Singapore based uh, startup. Our headquarters is there. Uh, our co-founders actually started off at uh, Singtel, Singapore Telecom. They did a hackathon uh, back in their days during Singtel and one thing led to another. And this idea about a smart door lock came to be. 
So uh, that led them to be more entrepreneurial and say, hey, let's just quit our jobs and start off this endeavor. And so we've been at it for the last almost three, three years and, and, and change. And uh, I started with the company back at the end of 2016. Um, so what happens is that uh, my background is in security, mm-hmm. hardware, um, access control. I had worked for a bit of time in Asia. And um, now I'm back in um, California where I grew up and I was just looking for something compelling to do. And I found startups as a space that I was really interested in. And Eagle Home just had a very compelling, interesting uh, portfolio of products that were, you know, good looking and, and, and it appealed to, to you know, consumers. And I just like the space and here we are. Yeah. Um, Igloo Home, what basically we're doing is trying to make smart access management easy. Um, we, we have a very interesting concept where uh, you can remotely uh, manage your devices by deploying uh, codes that work uh, at different times with algorithms. So I don't want to get too technical, but basically all you have to do is set up the device with your handphone. All of the smart is in the smartphone, and the devices are working on Bluetooth, and you can create codes without being next to the locks. And there's a lot of advantages to that because you don't have to create a lot of infrastructure with network, pay for additional fees, things like that. So we're trying to simplify the smart access. Now, and, and, and of course, the entire idea of smart access, I think that, uh, you know, growing up without smart locks, uh, we always, you know, we had maybe, um, uh, let's say someone coming in to fix an appliance and we'd have to tell them, you know, we keep the spare key behind the dryer, behind the house, uh, you know, a little magnetic clip, you can find it there, or we hit a key underneath the flower pot, or someone would have to stay home from work and, you know, meet them here, let them in, you know, let them do their job and waste a vacation day just to simply get something done. Um, the exactly. idea, the, the idea of a smart home and the idea of the smart entryway, smart access, uh, talk about what, pain point are you really alleviating by doing this because you know i just laid out you know kind of the hassle before um yes. how do you fix this with with igloo home so our whole central uh uh core principle is secure and easy uh key exchange right and so the very first product that that we had uh invented was the first uh smart key box or we call lock boxes here so I think it was an a interesting product because that's where you put keys. You don't have to change anything on your door. And by having a smart device like that, you can just put the smart element in the lockbox and you put the mechanical keys there and you can mount it anywhere around the house. So how we come around that idea was because uh, a lot of us at, Airbnb, uh, at Igloo Home excuse me, uh, had also been dabbling in doing a lot of uh, home sharing or on Airbnb. So we saw the pain point of key exchange and having to wait for somebody like you just mentioned and say, hey, you know, we're trying to you know, develop some technology that can kind of solve this problem. So that's how everything got started. Um, and, and we felt that basically by working with uh, algorithms, uh, you can create pin codes that just work for a certain duration of time and you don't have to be next to the device to, to, to deploy the codes. Um, so you, I can basically provide any code from anywhere in the world remotely, and, and people can come up to the device to get the codes. I don't have to worry that they have open uh, codes that will work forever. They just expire at the time I designate. It can be anywhere from one hour all the way up to one year. And once they're used, they get tracked in the device. And uh, once they're expired, they, they can't no longer use them. So. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, super question, uh, you mentioned that there's like a time element to it, but is right. there also, let's say like a one-time use code, like it would automatically just kind of stop working after one or two uses, or is it just strictly, uh, you know, set between every Wednesday at four to 5 PM or, you know, expire after Tuesday? Like what are some of the different ways that you can kind of set a, t- a code to work for? Yeah, so there's a lot of different types of codes and access we can uh, deploy. One is just a standard pin code that works all the time. That's a permanent pin. Mm-hmm. Uh, another is a duration pin that you can, that I mentioned that works perfectly with you know any kind of duration based use for checking in and checking out, like Airbnb or a service that you need somebody to use for, like a contractor that's fixing you know, cleaning your house for a day or, or fixing up something in your house for renovations, you know, during a week say Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., you know. And lastly, we can also create one-time pins that just work once. Once they're used, they're burned, and you can't use them again. 
so people can feel very uh, secure and have a peace of mind to know that codes that are shared are not permanently shared and that they have a system in place with our Eagle Home locks that you know, kind of manage that without having the hassle of, of, of going in and messing with the lock all the time. So, and, and you know, uh, we were just checking out the key box, you know, uh, the first the, the first iteration that you had out there. Uh, and I see here on your website that you are now offering here shortly. I think you can pre-order it. Uh, the, the key box too. What is difference? Uh, what is the difference between the first generation and the second generation? So, Essentially, on the software side, the system works the same. What we had found out uh, from our experience selling it, uh, we launched the Keybox 1, the original Keybox, back at Airbnb Open in November of uh, 2016, though, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sometime back. Then we officially shipped it globally in f February of last year, 2017. We've had about a year or so under our belt of different use cases, so we felt there was a lot better hardware changes that we can make the product better from the experiences that feedback that our customers gave us. So main change in the key box too would be there's bigger space for the compartment, about 20% more to put, you know, key fobs and other types of keys with larger key rings in it. Uh, the weatherproofing for uh, 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 weather and dust resistance has increased. Uh, we eliminated keys to, to be able, you have to have keys to open up the shackle on top to unhook it onto things. Now you can just open it from the inside and a hit, little hidden switch. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of little bells and whistles, uh, especially uh, one thing we, we, we also did was um, the keypad on the outside, it's, it's touch-based. It used to be a blue LED. We found that in direct sunlight, you know, given the device out, is out kinda in the outdoors, yeah. kind of hard to see. So we, we increased the contrast by using a white LED on a black body. So a lot of simple things that we thought were that made the product better. And have a better experience. Yes. Now, now coming from your background, you mentioned that you were in, you know, in security and hardware, that kind of thing. Uh, what what really you know kind of impresses you about working with Igloo Home? I mean, just talk about the build quality because when you talk about you know so, some of these Bluetooth devices, they can uh, you know. At some price points, and I'm not saying that you know your price point is low by any means, but at some price points, you're kind of competing with you know maybe a twenty dollar alternative to your one hundred and fifty, two hundred dollar alternative, and there's clearly going to be a difference in quality. But just speak to Igloo Homes quality in terms of build and security. Uh, I, I mean, are, are you impressed? Is it uh, or is it you know suitable? How do you feel about this device? Okay, so there's a natural uh, assumption that, oh, if it's a digital device, maybe you have to have a trade-off of a compromise on the physical aspects. So that's not necessarily true, especially with our device. It's actually more heavy-duty, and if you hold it in your hand, you know, it's, it's more than almost a, a pound uh, in weight. And so um, I would like to say, you know, jokingly, it eats other lock boxes for lunch, you know. But uh, definitely, we don't compromise on the mechanical aspects just so we have electronics in it. So um, Bluetooth, um, we also have a very secure protocol for how it works. So you know, it's not prone to hacking. Um, that's also why we don't have Wi-Fi on it, because we, we want to make it as secure as possible. And just the ease of use, um, I think you know, if you share a code, the recipient, they punch in the code and, and they use it. There's no need to, for them to download an app. So um, it has kind of the best of both worlds, I would say. I would say so. And, you know, just uh, I, I'm seeing it pop up here a couple times on your website, uh, a couple mm -hmm. times here in the questions. Airbnb. Um, it's it's really really popular, especially in in towns and cities with very expensive you know hotels and rent and things like that. It's uh, you know something that I think people are really opening you know the idea that hey I could have someone in my home uh, you know just for a couple nights and I'll never see them again and it's perfectly okay you know hey that's uh, that's a perfectly legitimate way to right. kind of run your household. <laughs> but right. you're right you know you do come across that well how do I know that if I give them a key. Uh, you know, they didn't run out and make a copy or blah, blah, blah. Uh, if you want to go ahead and branch out this conversation to first off, uh, what's with all the integration into Airbnb that you do? And then we can transfer that into, uh, I believe it's called the Deadbolt 2S or the Mortis. I don't. Correct. Uh, Mortis Lock. Yeah, uh, or the Mortis Lock. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about uh, your Airbnb integration and then go on over to the actual like door lock instead of just a, uh, a instead of just like a key holder or a padlock. Right. So um, 
across all our products, uh, we have a partnership with Airbnb. So within our app, we have a optional connection with the platform. So you can log in if you're a host uh, uh, on a, uh, with, with our product. You can, whether it's the door lock or the key box, you log into your host account, you can link up a listing that you manage into our app. What happens is that we automate the process of the check-in and check-out. So you don't have to be there as a host to hand out keys, welcome somebody. Especially now, a trend I think going forward, a lot of guests that check in, they, they might not want to be uh, uh, waiting for you to, to, you know, to meet somebody. They just want to get in and get out and actually have it be an easier check-in process. And also this is great for the host because they just give out a secure pin. It works just for the duration of the access that they provided on, uh, uh, for the check-in and check-out duration, and it's all automated. And how it works is that once a booking is confirmed on Airbnb platform, uh, and we have a back-end integration with the, uh, their Airbnb system officially. Uh, we get the details for the booking on the calendar. We generate the code on behalf of the host, and we send out that PIN code as a duration PIN that matches that, that booking uh, so that they just receive it by email on the day of their check-in. So it's a very hands-free process for the host. All you do is just you know, purchase a lock, link it up to the Airbnb account. When you get a booking, it does everything else for you. So um, some people like the fact that there is a key box and they don't have to you know, change anything on their door. Mm -hmm. So obviously the Deadbolt 2S and the Mortis are more uh, robust systems because then you can not have a key box that you have to mount or hang and that can just change out the main door lock. What's cool about that is I can still use my own codes, uh, and then I also have multiple or different kind of codes for other people for the door lock as well. Uh, and you can track access or get these uh, access logs from the device when you're next to it, and it'll, it'll track different things. One, any pin codes that were expired and reused, uh, it was invalid, uh, what times uh, the, the, the certain pin codes were used, as well as a uh, battery status and things like that. So information is there when you need it, but you don't feel like you have to be connected all the time to the internet to receive that information. You just walk up to it, sync it, and you get that information. That's very, very cool. And, uh, and again, speaking to the design of these things, uh, for anyone out there listening on the radio, very, very, uh, you know, obviously very sleek. It's uh, very minimal. There's a keypad, touchpad on there. Also a place for, I guess, a swipe card if you are running a very sophisticated Airbnb, uh, you know, kind of operation here. But overall, I mean, you guys really put a lot into the design of, of, of these things. They're very, they're very modern and very sleek. Well, thank you. Yeah, because... I think, you know, there shouldn't be a trade-off either in, you know, function over form. I think they work hand in hand. And who doesn't like a nice product, right? Right. So, I mean, you're going to put it on your door. You want it to look good and not just work. So, uh, for us, um, we like to make sure it's an appealing product in terms of not just for Airbnb specific use, but if you're just looking to, you know, get into, you know, curious about buying a smart door lock, here's one that you can find it's very uh, um you know, good looking for you to be compelled to buy it. <laughs> right. And, and, and it's not that you have to have a, a, a expensive product in order to have it look nice. I think that that's, and we like making cool products at work, you know? Right. Why not? Right. No. And, and uh, actually speaking of those who maybe are, you know, maybe on the fence, they're, uh, you know, they're tired of having to worry about uh, locks and, you know, letting people in and things like that. Uh, talk about or uh, name talk about talk to those people who you touched on on this a little bit earlier, but who are still on the fence about the idea of having something electronic control uh, whether or not they can get into your door. Because you know, I've uh, I'll just tell you you know kind of how we outline it here on the show. Whenever we have people you know either call in or message us and ask about you know our our smart door lock safe is that you know is that okay for me and my family. And it's, I always kind of reply, it's like, you know, um, a lot of them are just as robust as regular key, you know, key lock deadbolt kind of deal. Um, and I know that people are worried about the, the cybersecurity aspect of it, that, you know, someone's going to James Bond their way in with their watch and, you know, two buttons and they're in. But really, uh, you know, whenever we hear about these hackings, we're like, you know, through enough brute force and cracking and, you know, that kind of thing. Like if you give them like three hours alone with your device, maybe they might be able to crack it. But uh, someone could also walk up to your front door, take a brick and shatter the window five feet away and be in within a couple seconds. Like, 
Correct. Talk, talk about people who, who are maybe on the fence because I've been encouraging people to not be afraid of these things. What, what do you have to say about that? Well, I think um, the way we've designed a product, uh, uh, especially the Deadbolt, um, it's a retrofit product. So if you have in most, I guess, in the U.S., uh, uh, I want to put a number on it, but a majority of the residential uh, uh, places have a deadbolt. And on the mm-hmm. bottom, you have a knob or a pull handle or a lever handle. So it's compatible in the sense that you just have to swap it out. So there's no need in most cases to cut out any new holes or any additional work. It's a pretty DIY-based product. So the the barrier of entry in terms of the technical side of how to get in a door, it's the same as if you're trying to uh, swap out one mechanical deadbolt with another. Secondly, at its core, our deadbolt is a mechanical door lock. It can still work without any batteries. With the batteries, uh, you just take four AA alkaline. They work from nine to 12 months on its own. And if the batteries run out, you can still use mechanical keys to get in anytime you want. So, uh, And then thirdly, we also have a nine volt uh, jump start on the bottom and the front of the the interface of the product itself so if you ran out of batteries they got low there was a warning they still died out you can go and just uh, jump start put a 9 volt on the bottom and all your codes will remain working and or you have your keys maybe you you can put a key in your office or in your glove box and they will always have a backup key that works without electronics as well mm-hmm. and i think um the other part of it is you know i guess if anybody's kind of not as tech tech savvy I would say, I mean, information is key. You would, do, you still would like to know who came in when, or if something happened, uh, and you you can come back to information that's at the disp- at your disposal, right? Right. So that kind of enables you to have that without having to have you know additional setup costs, except just buying the product and using it. Our app is free. Um, another thing I, I would kind of recommend is. Um, you don't have to have it integrated with anything. You just pair it like you pair of head of Bluetooth headphones and you start using it and, and you just, you know, go from there. So um, it, it's not too much of a leap of faith. It's just, you know, think of it as a mechanical door lock that has electronic and smart components on it. And a right. lot of the smart aspect is from the phone, which you are always using already anyways. So. So, and uh, another, it, it seems like the entryway for a lot of different products is a very, uh, a, a very simple way to introduce people into the idea of a smart home because, you know, you put a, a Wi-Fi connected camera in, you know, in their doorbell and suddenly you can see who's at the door before, you know, without even being home or having to go to the door. And it, 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 it's a very simple, you know, kind of understanding of it. Um, door locks and what you're offering here with the deadbolt as well makes a lot of sense. But I feel like there could also be a space where, um, you know, kind of mixing too many products, too many ecosystems, it can get a little bit kludgy. Uh, do you may, exactly. maybe work well with other products or do you kind of expect people to be like, uh, you know, we're going to start, we're going to get the, you know, we're, we're going to get the, I think it's like the, the deadbolt, let's see, the deadbolt 2S and, you know, and then we're going to go from there. Uh, how do you feel about well, mixing and matching these different devices that you can get? Right. So, so yes, there is a whole ecosystem out there now of everything connecting everything else. What you know, like Internet of Things, and how the doorbell connects to your 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 smart your your home te- uh, thermometer, a uh, tem- thermostat, excuse me, uh, your smart refrigerators, and all that. But I think in in our product, the way we've kind of approached it is, we don't want you to have to connect to everything else to make it work. It, it works as a standalone device. Um, basically, um, we do have integrations just through our Airbnb partnership. Uh, but we're not trying to make it so that you have to connect it to other things to make it smarter or for it to actually work you need, for the way you need it to. Um, the only drawback people have come back to us and say, oh, I can't remotely unlock my door. Hmm. Um, so, but then our, our uh, take on it is, why would you want to do that? Nobody's home, you shouldn't open a door for somebody that claims to be there, right? So what you should do, and what we try to, you know, as a best practice to educate our customers or potential customers, you know, you can give them a one-time PIN code. You can give them a duration-based PIN code that you share with them, text it to them, email it to them, tell it to them after you create it right then and there on the spot when you're not home. Give it to them. They can use it. And then you can make sure that when they use it, when you do come home, you can actually track it and see it on the access logs. And it's, it's just not a good idea to open the door when nobody's there. So... Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the same difference, right? It, it, essentially, if I give you the code and you punch it in, I'm more, 
I guess at peace than if I open the door, you then you claiming to be there. Right. Yeah, it, it 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 still gives you the same functionality, but on top of that, it uh, it I, I mean, like at its very base, it prevents you from ever really being able or i'm sorry it prevents anyone else from being able to unlock your door because you know if you don't have that functionality they don't uh but there's still kind of a kind of a workaround so hey that's that's certainly something talk about use cases because we mentioned uh the airbnb and that makes a lot of sense but talk about you know maybe just like a home for you know uh, four people uh your classic nuclear family or uh what other use cases are you finding your customers are saying this works really well so um, on the B2B side, we have a lot of property managers and real estate companies that want to uh, use this, uh, depending if it's a door lock or it's the lockbox. So lockboxes naturally just uh, fit well with real estate uh, sectors because they want to be able to put this in front of a, a house they're listing. It could be a very nice private showing where some customers now also, or potential buyers or renters, they don't want the agent in their face and have to schedule something with them to, to see a property, right? So what they can do now if they use the Igloo Home key box, uh, they could just share a code with them that works for that day. They don't have to, you know, worry that they'll come back or not come back. And they don't have to, you know, look at a property with the agent there, you know. And a lot of agents appreciate that as well as the, the prospective buyers. On the uh, property management side, we have a lot of people that actually like those short-term rentals, vacation rentals. They might not be on-premises. So... They, they, they can get our product installed and they can deploy codes just from their office or uh, anywhere else be it not being there. Uh, another case is a, a lot of cleaning services. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you would provide a code for a cleaner that just works at certain durations. And um, there's a way to track all that, like I, I, I say. But um, that, that's some of the initial use cases we've had. Now we have a new product that we just launched on Indiegogo, which is the Padlock working on the same principles, but now we're trying to expand that footprint for where we can kind of apply our technology. You can now put it on delivery boxes. We have a lot of use cases overseas, and that's what in, uh, uh, initially motivated us to develop the padlock was for logistics, uh, shipping. Um, so there's, there's definitely you know, any place that requires any kind of uh, smart access, information tracking, uh, but without needing a whole network to make it work is kind of where we're trying to fit in. Because I think there's already a lot of connected devices. And so we have our own take on how we think the smart aspects can be better. I, I and, and I can't but think you're right. I mean, there's a lot of products that I think the engineers, when they do it, they say, what's possible? And they say, okay, let's do that. And then they never step back and think, is that what people really use this device for? So I'm looking at your padlock here. Uh, I believe you launched this thing through, I want to say Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Uh, just, Indiegogo. It, yeah, uh, uh, Indiegogo. Just real quick, uh, you know, we only have like a couple minutes here. Tell us about okay. how uh, your crowdfunding uh, campaigns, either this one or past ones, uh, crowdfunding, is that something that you'd kind of recommend to others? Like, uh, do, do you guys enjoy doing them? I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, platform because it does give us an early insight on the demand for a product without having to make a bunch of them first and hopefully you know, our, our customers will, will come, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not always the case where you build it, they will come, right? Especially when you have inventory. So this helps for us, a company like our size, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're somewhat of a startup and we're in the growth phase. Mm-hmm. And we didn't do it with our products, but we did it with, with this one because we felt that it's, it's a very universal product. Padlocks, you can be found everywhere. And we, it's it's a somewhat of a more gadgety device. You don't have to install it. And uh, we like the design. It looks really different from other padlocks, and it does a lot more than what is already offered in the market. So I would recommend it for any companies that are looking to um, just get some market feedback before they actually launch. And if you see, we within the first week, we got about 200% of our uh, funding campaign goal. And we still have another two and a half weeks left. So we're pretty excited, and then now we're able to build in some stretch goals to see if other kind of things we didn't include initially will be kind of uh, uh, useful, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so I think it's it's great. It's a really good way to to kind of get some uh, initial insights, and I recommend any tech company or any company that's dealing in hardware. Uh, like I say, hardware is hard. So um, this is one of the things that make it a little bit easier, uh, give us as manufacturers a, a little bit of peace of mind and, and, and direction. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I will say that's uh, that's what I've heard from others here on the show is that, yeah, you know, the money, that's certainly great, but uh, the money can always come a little bit later. But the really big thing is the, the feedback and the communication with your customer. That is, you know, just really, really impressive on these, uh, you know, startup sites. But uh, yeah. with, with that, though, Matthew, I will say that, uh, uh, that hey, we're just flat out of time. This half hour has flown on by. Uh, if people want to find out more information, wow. we have a link to your website. But uh, if you want to have the last word, uh, where should people go to, to find out more? So our website is igloohome.co. And uh, it's everything's there. Also, we have our products being sold on various websites uh, here uh, on e-commerce sites as uh, Amazon, uh, Newegg.com, Newegg for Business, um, uh, Walmart.com, Home Depot.com. We're also in Best Buy Canada. And so there's a lot of places that you can find us if you just Google us. But I think the initial place is to, to get the right information is eaglehome.co. Mm -hmm. And anybody can just reach out to us and we'll... we'll pretty responsive. We try to just, you know, talk to everybody and we like to talk to our customers and people that like our product. That's so. great. All right. And, and, and Hey, uh, that's exactly what we want to hear. So, uh, everyone will include links to those in the show notes here at computer America, Matthew, until, uh, you know, until we speak to you again, these products, they look really, really good. You guys should be proud of what you've done. And, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much. Us. Thank you, Ben. Um, yes. So the padlock, uh, hopefully, if you guys, I want to give a little bit of more of a pitch, but uh, just look for us on Indiegogo. Just look up Eagle Home. It's right there. And it's going to be launching in quarter one of next year. So very we're cool. excited about that. And get that early bird perk. <laughs> All right. Yeah, very, very cool. And uh, everyone, you can find links there. And Matthew, until next time, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great show. Bye, Ben. Bye-bye. Right. All right, everyone, and there he goes. We'll be right back, more Computer America, and we're going to switch on over to computer and technology news right after this. Everyone, stay tuned. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer, and again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? low-cost airlines with one call to low-cost airlines you'll drastically slash your travel costs we're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations where would you like to go london rome costa rica australia wow that's cheap so why wait call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the u.s or international our prices are so low we can't publish them the only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airline travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 33 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And everyone, I hope that you enjoy the interview from Igloo Home. And as I said, they make very, very sleek looking products. And uh, hey, the entryway is a very natural place to start your home automation trend. It's uh, hey, definitely something you, you can check out. And like they said, they're available through any number of retailers, both physical and online. You can check them out. So if you miss any part of the show so far, you can, of course, check out the Computer America podcast, which is simply today's show in its entirety rebroadcast anywhere and everywhere. 
that you can find podcasts. And uh, definitely recommend that you check that out. It's at your convenience. And hey, it's the second best way to listen to Computer America. The first being, of course, live either, uh, either on video or here at IRN. Now, let's switch gears over to computer and technology news. So this is a segment dedicated entirely to what's new, what's different, different products, and uh, what's newsworthy. Everyone, here we go. Lots and lots of stories. Yes, Chrome, I do indeed want to open that many tabs because these news stories uh, let's start off with some good news and good news indeed for Netflix. And I think it's because Netflix has good news for you. That's why this is working out so well for them. Now, if you didn't catch it, uh, Netflix actually released their, uh, their subscription numbers. And a lot of people were worried that as the streaming market starts to heat up, well, uh, what is Netflix going to do? You know, the previous king of of streaming content, they now have a lot of competition. A lot of other uh, companies and and uh, producers out there are trying to put out their own competing services. And maybe, hey, maybe Netflix gets cut out of the whole deal. But as they have shown, that is not the case. Even though Netflix is not the only game in town anymore, it is still by far the most popular game in town. So this is an article from CNET saying that Netflix's 137 million subscribers evaporate fears of a free fall. That's right. Now it's, uh, yeah, Netflix has done a lot. Netflix crested over 137.1 million worldwide subscribers in the three months since July squashing fears that the world's biggest paid online TV service may be on the brink of a downslide. And again, those worries are coming on the heels that content is always being pulled from Netflix. Rarely is is content being added to Netflix that is, uh, you know, owned by some of their competitors, including Fox or, uh, you know, any of the other uh, distributors out there. But uh, hey, I guess a good mix. Of what uh, of what Netflix is doing has led them to really, you know, rise up. They said that the news reassures everyone that these uh, that the numbers last quarter were an early signal of a bad of bad news to come. Even as Netflix achieves the milestone of traditional TV, Netflix, for example, snapped HBO's 17 year streak of dominating the Emmys. I'm sorry, dominating the Emmys awards in the latest period as both Netflix and HBO tied at 23 wins. Really shows that uh, Netflix is putting out some very impressive content. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So all that being said, they said that, uh, but that means less Netflix uh, investors and analysts that subscriber growth, the one metric they track obsessively. So they have some harder numbers here that you can really pour over if you're all the interested. But the big thing here is that, uh, yeah, they added, let's see, uh, let's see, in the third quarter uh, results on Tuesday, Netflix international subscriber base increased by 5.87 million members to 78 million people, topping the 4.3 additions it had in the previous quarter. And in the U.S., uh, I'm sorry, in the U.S., Netflix added 1.09 uh, for a total of 58 million here in the U S which was besting its 650,000, uh, guidance or what they were expecting to get. All this means that 7 million new subscribers, if nothing else, uh, investors were expecting the numbers to slow down, but instead they, or even stop completely, but instead Netflix smashed it all together. So, the article, the article goes a bit more into the money side and things like that, but I will say Netflix has been putting out a lot of really good content lately. Netflix originals, um, that content that would not make it anywhere else because strictly for the fact that 
Netflix really doesn't care about eyeballs watching his content because they don't serve ads within their content. They don't make money off of, you know, uh, how many people are really watching something. So they can put something out that isn't maybe what they're planning on being a financial success, maybe in like a movie theater setting or a TV uh, viewing audience setting. As long as it keeps the people who are currently watching Netflix engaged, and on top of that, as long as it keeps uh, people subscribing to the service so that, hey, you know, did you catch that new Netflix series? No, I didn't. I need to, you know, get my subscription back up and running. That is all they really care about. They don't care about numbers. And, and trust me, they have them. They will never release them because, you know, that's not really a metric that matters to their core business model. So whether or not Netflix is doing it right, I think that they're doing it well. And investors love to see that. So there's that article. And with that being said, we can, of course, scoot on over to the next one. How about this one? Rumors, the rumor mill, it's always fun. Well, red hydrogen one specs have been leaked as the launch approaches. And as I said before on the show, these leaks happen so conveniently that they're like one week ahead from everyone else knowing. And... Yeah, I, I I refuse to believe that it's not the case that many of these companies quote unquote leak their products ahead of actually um, launching them just because it's a good form of advertising. It gets everyone talking and gossiping about their product. So, okay, here we go. The Hydrogen One specs, the red Hydrogen One. Now, if you have not been fo- uh, you know, following this whole story, we've been keeping an eye on it. It's a pretty interesting idea because Red, they make, uh, they make movie cameras. They're, whenever you see those giant movie digital shooting movie cameras, they cost like $400,000. They're very, very good at what they do, but this is their first attempt to bring something back down to consumer space as opposed to maybe even the prosumer space. It's a, it's a bold, risky, different kind of move. So with that being said, the Red Hydrogen 1 is finally set to start shipping pre-orders this week following a few delays, but if you can wait until then, a full spec sheet for the phones has leaked a bit early in a new infographic, and we're going to go ahead and throw up an infographic here on the show, you can kind of see it there. Uh, hey, we at least now know a couple of the specs. They said that while I've known bits and pieces of this before, it's nice to see it all laid out in one single place. And most of the specs are on par for a high end Android phone in 2018 including 128 gigabytes of storage, six gigs of RAM, uh, 4,500 milliamp battery. And you know, all that's pretty, the battery's a little bit bigger than I think what we're used to with 4,000 or something like that, but uh, otherwise pretty in line. Aluminum or titanium, depending on uh, what model you're being offered. And they said that uh, uh, it also includes stereo speakers, 5.7 inch screens, so not iPhone XS uh, Max but rather just a 5.7 inch, which is going to be uh, still still pretty hefty, still, you know, st- still hefty, and a 2560 by 1440 resolution display. So not 4K, but definitely higher than high definition, 1080p. Uh, the sheet doesn't mention it, but Red previously announced that the Hydrogen 1 will ship with last year's Qualcomm Snapdragon 835 chip instead of the newest 845 which is a bit disappointing since it's at $1,195. Now, and you can, of course, see it here, uh, you know, some, some of the features that aren't uh, readily uh, talked about include little ridges on the side of the phone that are going to help people to, uh, you know, kind of grip the phone in their hand. The, your fingers are going to wedge nicely into those little slots. Uh, it will have a Gorilla Glass screen. Let's see, uh, front-facing, uh, front 
facing camera is going to have 8.3 megapixels, whereas the rear camera will be a 12.3 megapixel shooting at over 4K with an LED and flashlight. Overall, if you are in the market for a new phone and you're willing to go with something not Apple, not Samsung, so far, everything that I can you know kind of see here, this is going to be this is this is going to be the best competitor I've seen. Uh, you know, even to the Pixel Three, I think this is even a little bit better than the Pixel Three. Uh, this is the be best competitor I've seen that is not from companies you've probably heard of before. So while I am not a fan, well. I, the price tag is actually lower than I thought it'd be. A lot of people were speculating that this was going to be like an $1,800 phone, but for this to come in at about $1,200, very, very different uh, than what we were expecting. And it has a couple of different features, very, very masculine. Uh, I don't think that this is going to appeal to uh, women. Uh, just, I'll just say that. Unless women, you are very enamored with the idea of a rugged aluminum and Kevlar construction. That is, uh, you know, hey, that is exactly what they called it. Rugged aluminum and Kevlar construction available in black or shadow aluminum and titanium. So either black or gray and very, very masculine. Let's put it that way. Uh, I'm hoping that the hands-on with this really knocks your socks off because otherwise this seems like a... Uh, a very a very capable phone, but a phone is going to have to be much more than just on par with the others, especially if they don't have the backing of, let's say, Apple or uh, Samsung. They are going to have to really impress to make sure that they make another one. So there you have it. Uh, good to finally see Red coming out with uh, you know kind of with what they can do, but. Hey, I'm also looking forward to seeing it in person. So the last one, and, and by the way, one more feature that, uh, you know, that we didn't really highlight here. Uh, one of the biggest features is the so-called 4V display that will offer some kind of holographic view, although Red has been coy about exactly how that tech works. And uh, yeah, you know, all that being said, we're going to have to wait another week to really dig into what they offer. But these specs, the, this leak, it looks uh, very tempting. And again, I'm excited to hear more about it. Now, turn your attention to an article from Recode about a product that when we mentioned it the first time, it was with Sandy Berger, I believe it was last Wednesday. And we were talking about the Facebook portal. This article just coming out from Recode, and it confirms what everyone else assumed. It turns out that Facebook could, in fact, use data collected from its portal in-home video device to target you with ads, saying that who you call and what apps you use could determine what ads you see. Facebook has announced Portal last week to take on the in-home voice-activated speaker market to its rival competitors from Amazon, Google, and Apple. The biggest question surrounding the device, why should anyone trust Facebook enough to put Facebook-powered microphones and video cameras in their living room or kitchen? Saying that given Facebook's year of privacy and security issues, privacy around the device has been an important part of the story surrounding Portal. And that's why he said that we need to update our reporting. So. By our reporting, he means Recode, saying that last Monday uh, they wrote no data collected through portal, even call log or app usage, like the fact that you listen to Spotify, will be used to target users with ads on Facebook. I can see now, according to the title and that particular sentence, how those can be completely opposed. Uh, they said that uh, we wrote that because that's what we were told by Facebook executives, but Facebook has since reached out to change its answer. Portal does not have ads. So the actual device that you're paying hundreds of dollars for to put in your, you know, in your house, that does not have ads. But that's not the whole story. 
saying that Portal can be used to target you with ads on other Facebook-owned properties. So think Facebook Messenger, Facebook, the actual well, Facebook application, uh, WeChat. It's going to store your data, attribute it to you, and let's say you use a lot of, uh, I don't know, you use a lot of uh, streaming services to listen to a lot of music. Hey, maybe they'll target you with other music-oriented systems i don't know they say and uh let's see but facebook has since, since changed his answer blah 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 saying that that isn't very surprising considering facebook's business model the biggest benefit of facebook owning a device in your home is that it provides the company with another data stream for its ad targeting business he added that portal team doesn't plan to use the data for ad targeting purposes because portal doesn't run ads which was part of the confusion Hmm. It could, however, be used to target ads with other apps. Uh, yeah, the confusion though is exactly why people uh, is, is exactly why people have concerns around Portal and any other Facebook-owned app or device right now. Explaining exactly what data Facebook collects has been a challenge for the company. Properly explaining that with a new in-home device equipped with a microphone and a video camera is even more important. Facebook, if you're listening, the problem that you have here is that people do not trust you. Whenever you hear these stories that Facebook has been, uh, you know, uh, throughout, you know, through the Facebook API, uh, so and so many millions of Facebook users have had their personal data uh, stolen or compromised or sold. It's it's not a good look, and you're saying, hey, trust us to collect even more data that we don't know what's exactly relevant to you, but you're going to collect it anyways. It's, uh, I, I don't see Facebook portal being a commercial success. I, I, I would really be surprised if it was, but there you have it. So let's actually jump from Facebook to Facebook because Facebook had another story, uh, kind of break today. And this is one that anyone who runs a business big or small, Facebook, when it comes to advertising, is really the best game in town. You know, there's uh, there's some through Google. You know, there's some through Google that you can do, but that's not exactly uh, the best place to get engagement. Or you could do Twitter, but Twitter is a joke. Uh, Facebook, when it comes to advertising your business, has really been the only and best game in town. Well, turns out that through a glitch, quote unquote. Facebook has been lying to advertisers or misleading them, I guess would be the better word. This article from the Mercury News saying that Facebook lured advertisers by inflating ad watch times up to 900% lawsuits. This one should have been obvious. I want to take a show of hands for anyone out there who has seen a video advertisement off to the right of their news feed and said, Let's click that. Let's watch that. I want to see what they're pushing. And by a show of hands, looking out across the room, none of you, because none of you are here in the studio with me. But I will say that no one has ever clicked on a video ad and said, I need to watch this. Let me stop myself for 30 seconds and really pay attention. Now, that universal truth leads us to the story and why Facebook is in pretty big trouble for messing with people's advertising. Now, not only did Facebook inflate ad watching metrics by up to 900%, but it knew for more than a year that its average viewership estimates were wrong and kept quiet about it. And that is what a new legal filing claims. A group of small advertisers suing the Menlo Park social media titan alleged that the filing, uh, I'm sorry, alleged in the filing that Facebook induced advertisers to buy video ads on its platform because advertisers believe Facebook users were watching video ads for longer than they actually were. So again, this was a, this was a glitch or uh, this was a glitch. This was a bug. This was just a, an erroneous uh, piece of software 
and they kept quiet about it because the numbers look so good. Why would you ever take money away from yourself? They said that that unethical, unscrupulous behavior by Facebook constituted fraud because, uh, yeah, because it was likely to deceive advertisers, and that is what the filing claimed. Now, Facebook knew by January 2015 that its video ad metrics had problems and understood the nature of the issue within a few months, but sat on the information for more than a year, and that is, again, according to the lawsuit. Now, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. I'm trying to figure out what exactly led to the uh, error. Facebook in 2016 had revealed that the metrics problem, saying it had recently discovered it. The firm told the advertisers that it had probably overestimated the average time spent watching video ads by 60 to 80 percent. Today's filing alleged that Facebook had instead inflated the average watch time by 150 to 900 percent. If you've never done advertising through Facebook, in a lot of cases, you pay a set amount and then you, uh, you know, and then whatever you agree to, uh, you know, kind of be your audience or things like that. As soon as X amount of people watch your content and, uh, you know, and you pay, I don't know, 23 cents or, you know, whatever the amount is for that particular piece of content, it kind of sucks it out of that fund and then you have to pay for it. Now, if you overpaid by 900%, that means that you were getting a fraction of the service that you actually paid for. And you are well overdue a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of advertising. Because, hey, you know, starting companies, their, their advertising revenue is, or I'm sorry, their advertising budget is very, very stringent. You can't be misplacing that and to just suck it dry. Very, very bad. So that's what the lawsuit alleges. We'll see and keep an ear and eye out to uh, figure out if that lawsuit goes anywhere. But yeah, I, Facebook did admit that they have been doing this wrong for the past couple of months. Back in 2016, of course. Now, oh man, so many stories, no time. I think we had a couple others that we really wanted to get to. Um uh, so just real quick, some of the headlines, and then uh, you know before the show ends, T-Mobile, you know them. They sell they sell cell phones, and they sell you the data plan with it. Well, the data plan slash payment plan, T-Mobile is trying something different. Maybe you'll be enticed if you want lower phone payments, but longer phone payments. That's where you are getting into the 36 month installment plan. That's right. No longer are you looking at 12 month or 24 month, but now 36 month to pay off that $1,400 iPhone. Maybe that will entice you in there to buy one. If you know, even though you're locked into the same phone for three years, maybe you're happy because you are going to have ac you know access to the iPhone 10s Max or something. But there you have it. We have officially jumped the shark and gone to 36 month payment plans. Uh, let's see, another one includes, <laughs> yeah, no time to get into that one. We'll save that one for later. Uh, Spotify, Spotify ad ban for causing distress to children. That's right. Saying that uh, a Spotify ad has been banned for unjustifiably distressing children. Much, much is the season, you know, Halloween coming up and all. A weird, creepy doll was, you know, kind of sitting there on the side and would suddenly move and scare people off to the side of the screen. If anything, that sounds like a very engaging ad, but at the same time, a very scary ad. Uh, let's see, there's that one. Um, man, just no others that we really have time for. Uh, essential phone. We've talked about the essential phone before. Well, some bad news. The essential phone cuts 30% of the workforce. And this is, of course, uh, coming on the heels of it canceling its next iteration of the essential phone. So if you were really hoping that this new phone hardware company was going, was, you know, going to go places, might have to rethink that because, you know, that might just not work. 
So there's that one. Apple could launch its first Macs powered by its own processors in 2020. If you have not been paying attention, Apple has been uh, designing its own A10, A12 processors for its smartphones for quite a while now. And you could definitely uh, see why they would want to bring that manufacturing over to their other line of products. But all that and more, just no time. Everyone, tomorrow on the program, assuming everything goes according to plan, we will have the one, the only, Mr. Marcel Gagné, where we will be talking all Linux, our all Linux program. It's going to be a lot of fun. You can find out more there at ComputerAmerica.com. So until tomorrow, everyone, have a great day. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for tuning in. And if you missed any part of today's show, feel free to check out the podcast and you can find us there. That's about it for today's show. Uh, Again, big thanks to Igloo Home for coming out and joining us here on on the show. It was a lot of fun. Very interesting to see their products and hear about it directly from them. And if you miss any part of today's show as well, ComputerAmerica.com. Go, go, go. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone.